Um, good evening, Hoffington, and welcome to the March uh, 18th, 2021 School Committee meeting. My name is Amanda Fargiano, and I'm the School Committee Chair, and I welcome you. I need to read to you a script from the governor. Um, as a preliminary matter, this is Amanda Fargiano, Chair of the School Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Uh, members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Leah Battler Rafferty. Aye. Uh, Meg Tyler. Aye. Joe Markey. Aye. Nancy Cavanaugh. Yes. Uh, thank you. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Carol Cavanaugh. I can't hear you, Carol. You're on mute. <laughs> but you're yes. here. Thank you. Uh, Susan Rutherman. Here. And Jen Parson. Yes. Um, and anticipated speakers on the agenda. I think tonight we have a few guests. We have two members of uh, Hopkins High School Student Council. We have Colby Michaud and Henry Edwards. Colby, are you here? Here. Nice to see you. Henry? Hello. Hi, nice to see you. And I think we have also a Ms. Valerie Lichansky here to join us uh, for a presentation on our agenda. I'm here. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, did I miss anybody? Carol, I guess I'm looking at you. Did I miss anybody? No. You know? yeah. Okay, great. All right. So this open meeting of the Hopkins School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Uh, tonight, I believe we are also here because HCAM is um, covering the Hopkinton girls volleyball team as they compete in the gym. So uh, we are here uh, to enable Hopkinton uh, HCAM to cover both. Um, in order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with Oh, sorry, I already read that. The executive order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. This meeting will also feature public comment as was posted with the agenda, um, and we will do that uh, shortly. Uh, for this meeting, we are meeting uh, via Zoom, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Uh, additionally, we are being broadcast by HCAM through its cable TV and YouTube channels. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials have been provided to members of this body and are available on the town's website via the web meeting calendar, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless noted otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda after they conclude their remarks. I will invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until I yield the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Uh, if you wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. And with that, um, uh, so for public comment, um, we have received public comments via email by 5 p.m. today. They are identified as public comments as posted in our uh, policy. I think it's BEDH on the website. Uh, public comments are limited to three minutes in length. Uh, so um, if someone is reading a public comment and I terminate them at three minutes, I am timing them. And that's why. So I apologize for that. Okay, now we are turning to the agenda. At this time, I'd like to invite all those who are willing and able to stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, 
Okay, first item on the agenda after that is recognitions. And I believe Dr. Kavanaugh, you had recognitions for tonight. I did have a couple of recognitions for tonight. Okay, so my first recognition, these are both high school recognitions. Um, the first is that um, Mr. Ben Lally, who has joined Hopkinton High School only a few years ago, um, has started a literary magazine at the high school, and the title of that is The Marginal. Um, they have submitted that to the NCTE, National Council of Teachers of English, and it turns out that they have a first class award this year, and it's called a Realm Award. And that stands for Recognizing Excellence in Art and Literary Magazines Program. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of the difficulty of earning this, so a lot of different high schools across the state and across the country will submit literary magazines to NCTE. And since 2008, only seven high schools in Massachusetts have been able to uh, acquire a Realm Award. So this right here is their marginal literary magazine. Um, some of the writing in this thing is absolutely amazing. If you are watching at home and you wanna get your hands on a copy, um, I, I would imagine there's gotta be an electronic copy that can be sent to you, um, but it certainly showcases the literary skills of the students at Hopkinton High School. Uh, my second recognition tonight um, came from Kristen Murphy, who you know is the advisor to the science fair. And she tells me that it is another exciting day in the world of science fair. Um, Hopkinton High School sent 12 projects to the regional fair and the results were released today. 11 of our, pro of our projects won prizes um, and they were selected to move on to the state fair, which happens in May. A special note, freshman Eva Bennett won a highly prestigious first place award, which will qualify her to attend the virtual international science fair. So a pretty amazing day for our science fair students, 11 out of 12 are moving on in competition. So two things for us to celebrate, um, some in the literary realm and some in the science realm. I would read you some of the students' names and their projects, but half of the words in the project title, I'm not sure I can pronounce. So that's how brilliant they are. So. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That's fabulous. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments other than just wow, but uh, thank you for sharing. It's great. Um, let's see, where am I? I think that brings us to public comment. I believe uh, Nancy and Joe are going to take turns reading the public comments received. I don't know who's going first, but let me get my timer, hang on. Just one second. <clears throat> When you're ready. Okay, can you hear okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. we're all nodding. All right, sorry. Okay, here we go. The first letter is from uh, Stasia Friedrich Crozy. She writes, Dear Dr. Kavanaugh and school committee members, thank you again for the hard work and additional hours that you continue to put in to ensure the best education possible for our children. As the planning process continues for a full return to school five days a week in the 2021 school year as mandated by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, I am writing to implore that the Hockenden schools ensure that regular on-site COVID testing is prioritized and implemented as part of this return. Doing so will ensure the safety of our teachers, staff, students, and families in our community. Current plans and models provided for this return indicate that you will be reducing social distancing from six feet to three feet while effectively doubling the student population at the same space in order to accommodate this full-time return. With these changes, schools are assuming additional risks related to increasing rates of transmission of COVID. Since March 1st, parents of high school students have seen more frequent notifications seven in the past 11 days than multiple members of their school community who have been exposed to COVID. The vast majority of our teens in high school will not be vaccinated until vaccinations are open to the general population, but our teens can expect to suffer the same health impacts and consequences as that of the adult population. Children younger than 16 cannot expect to be vaccinated at any point in 2021, but they can be carriers and transmit COVID to older or higher risk individuals without any obvious symptoms. That is why I am surprised to see that regular weekly pool testing is not cited as a priority in order to accommodate this return. The numbers that have been quoted for infection rates in our schools in recent presentations reflect only the positive rates of those tests after symptoms have appeared on a confirmed exposure has been determined via a close contact resulting from contact tracing. 
quite simply, the infection rates in our school communities cannot be accurately collected or communicated without testing of asymptomatic carriers of COVID. Continued outbreaks and exposures can be expected to frequently occur due to asymptomatic carriers who are not tested. In documentation provided by BESE, it was stated, quote, that pool testing would be universally available across the Commonwealth for all students and staff starting with a state-funded initial phase that began in February, end quote. Additionally, this guidance also indicated that, quote, approximately 50% of schools across the Commonwealth have signed up to administer pool testing on a weekly basis to proactively screen large numbers of students and staff for COVID-19. Participating schools can now quickly locate and isolate any individuals that test positive, end quote. Regular on-site testing via the state's pool testing program is recommended in guidance provided by DESE to meet in-person student learning time requirements and will mitigate these risks by ensuring appropriate testing and surveillance of asymptomatic carriers. Quote, we know COVID-19 positive individuals will be identified in schools as has been the case throughout the school year. However, districts and schools are well equipped with the necessary protocols to effectively manage these cases and prevent in-school transmission, including the testing, contact tracing, and quarantine procedures found in DESE guidelines. Thank you, Jim. Time's up? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Our next public comment is from Hopkinton resident Jennifer Fairbanks. Hi, I am a math teacher at Hopkinton High School. I am writing to ask you to reconsider opening the high school full time with everyone back. I have attended every school committee on Zoom. I have read every comment on Facebook. I do not believe teachers and students are being heard. We took a lot of effort to open up uh, in fashion, I'm sorry, open up in a hybrid fashion and it is working. My students are working, they are learning. They are putting in great effort to make this happening. My room is attached to the construction. We have been learning in a construction zone since September through jackhammering for nine days straight, through dueling saws with sawdust coming in through our windows. I am also a teacher who has been forced to live stream. We've adapted to a new schedule with the asynchronous Zoom. I am now being moved from my room due to construction. I have had 43 students who have had to quarantine this year. I have been contact traced twice myself. The most recent time I was notified on the 10th day, therefore I did not have to quarantine. We have jumped through every hoop, but I think bringing in all students full-time is not the answer. It will take a lot of schedule changes and money to bring everyone back. When one of my classes comes together, I will have over 50% of IEPs, which is not allowed. I am concerned about the students sitting closer together and getting tr traced and now missing more classes. With the new schedule, we will only gain 15 more classes. This does not include the interruptions due to AP exams and MCAS. The only reason I am hearing for bringing students back fully is for their mental health. Have you asked them? My students do not want to be in a room with more students closer together. They are enjoying smaller class sizes. We know all the studies support that. I think bringing them all back will increase, increase student stress and anxiety and be, be detrimental to their mental health. My wish is we could just finish the school year out as we have finally figured out. Okay, next letter is from Ruth Pagliuca. She writes, why can't all of the HHS students be tested for COVID ASAP? It is a documented fact that some people carry the COVID virus without exhibiting, exhibiting symptoms of the virus and are therefore carriers and spreaders of the virus that go undetected, but they can be detected through COVID-19 testing. Contact tracing has helped to remote Contact tracing has helped to remove some possible spreaders and test those individuals. However, we are still dealing with this problem with COVID cases since the February break ended where teachers and students took vacations over the break returning with the contracted virus and subsequently spreading it to HSS community. April vacation will be coming soon. What is stopping you from testing the entire HHS student population for COVID? Budget, DESE guidelines, HHS process, is there a threshold of students per week affected, total number of students affected, or some other statistic we need to meet prior to getting our HS students tested with all HS positive cases removed from the HS community and cases tracked? Can contraction of COVID-19 for HHS students be isolated to the outside of the HHS as we are hearing? I'd like to understand how to prove that fact. And frankly, I am highly skeptical of this fact. More positive COVID cases have caused more students to be removed from the HHS pending negative testing. Hopkins families are affected in quarantining students. 
I was told that over 100 students were removed and quarantined recently from the HHS for testing given the number of positive cases and contact tracing efforts. What will trigger the mass testing of HHS students for COVID-19 to curtail this current problem? The next comment is from Kathy Curry of Hopkinton. Hello, I am very disappointed with messaging from the superintendent. HPS had the opportunity to take advantage of a free trial for six weeks to truly determine the community spread in the school that they never monitored, yet closely state, constantly state unclaimed facts about. They chose to pass on that opportunity. Why? The school hides behind the term confirmed cases as a way to say spread that obviously exists does not exist. 20 cases in two weeks in the HHS is community spread. Trying to find an excuse or something else to blame is absurd. HHS, HMS, HES. I think this is as clear as the president, com clear as the president, commissioner, and governor all treat different schools in different ways. Glad to see the dates are different. I am tired of this mis misinformation to try and make a school look safer than it is. Transparency is skewed to what is wanted as opposed to what is best. This is people's lives and health, something no one making decisions was hired to assess. Schools are not magical places that defy logic. Kathy Curry. Next letter is from Kamiko Oga. She writes, what exactly dictates the change between last fall and now regarding the uptick in the number of COVID cases and not having to take precautions to go to remote learning? With the recent rise in cases, I'm concerned and would like to know the what, how, and why of not taking the same precautions as last fall. Thank you. The final, I think this is the final comment is from Hannah Ruren, who is a Hopkinton High School student. Hello, this email summarizes how everyone I have spoken to at the high school feels about the situation we are in. Therefore, I would appreciate if you read this in its entirety. I know that people keep saying this, but how do we know for sure that people are not getting COVID from going to school? Nobody at the high school scans the QR codes in the athletic center because the desks are always rearranged for after school sports and are put back in random orders every day. For example, at lunch yesterday, I was sitting next to my friend and my desk said 20 and my friend's desk said five. During lunch, our masks are off and we face each other to talk. If both of us got COVID, the school would not consider it an in-school transmission, although obviously it would be. I'm sure that this has happened before. Why else would a significant number of people from the high school be tested positive for COVID every day? Additionally, in the hallways, nobody is socially distanced. We are right up against each other because it is already so crowded with only half the students in school at a time. It doesn't even seem possible to be squished closer to someone, but when we go back to full time, I guess we will have to be. To make matters worse, I always see kids with their masks on below their noses or on their chins in the hallways. For example, yesterday, a teacher had to tell students to pull their masks up after they had been talking to each other less than an inch apart from each other for a long time. If these students get COVID, nobody would say it was from school because there's no written proof. No QR codes are scanned when you're walking next to someone. But that doesn't mean it actually was not from school. This is why I and everyone else in the high school find it so unbelievable and impossible that there have been zero cases from in-school transmission. That argument is not going to make us feel any better. I'm very worried about getting COVID and giving it to my unvaccinated autistic brother and parent. But going fully remote is also not an option because that would be terrible for my education, as also it would be for many others, which is a reason a lot of students don't want to go full remote despite being terrified that they will get it, or even worse, give it to someone higher risk than them. I don't know any high school student or teacher who actually feels safe going to school full time. Sure, there are arguments that parents cannot work if their children are home, which is why it makes much more sense for elementary and preschool kids to go back in full time, but it makes zero sense for high school that high schoolers need to rush back. High schoolers are or almost are adults. They don't need their parents to help them when they're home. There also was also an argument that the school sent to us that a student wrote that said he is stressed because he was a close contact and had to stay home, which made it hard for him to learn. So he wants to go back to school full time. I don't think that argument makes sense because if there are more people who go to school at a time, there will be more cases and more people will be close contacts and have to stay home. I don't understand why going back to school full time so more people can get COVID 
will alleviate his stress based on what they said. I feel awful for the teachers who are at high risk, are mostly unvaccinated, and have clearly expressed their concern by protesting outside the school. Thank you, I fear. Nancy. Thank you. Joe and Nancy, is that, is that the group? Thank you very much for reading that, and thank you to those who sent in comments. All right, um, student council reps, welcome. You've, thank you for sitting through our public comment uh, in the beginning of our meeting. Um, so tonight for the community, we have Henry Edwards and we have uh, Colby Michaud uh, and they're joining us from the high school and I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, as members of the student council, we, we will be sharing with you tonight the results of a survey we sent out um, as a student council regarding a full return to school. Um, the questions posed in this survey were largely qualitative questions, focusing on students' feelings and opinions. Colby and I have extrapolated some trends and have formed some quantitative points, both for and against a full return. Um, I will be representative of the student voices who do not want to return back to school. However, my statements are not indicative of my beliefs one way or the other. And Colby will be representative of the student voices who want to return to school. However, his statements are not indicative of his own beliefs one way or the other. Um, so to jump right into um, student hesitations about full return. Um, 88 out of the 108 total student responses or 82% were against a full return. Some of the reasoning from this majority group included recent spike in cases, stress primarily around social distancing, vaccination numbers of staff and students, April break travel, traffic, new schedule, and seniors only having a month left. The recent spike in cases has been alarming for many students, and some are facing confusion with being contact traced and quarantined. It is a bit unclear how this now large number of students who are quarantined should proceed with attending classes. Other students have voiced concerns about the larger classes and less social distancing, along with those two factors impacting contact tracing. Many students wanted all the teachers to be vaccinated before a full return to help ensure their safety and others' safety. Some students were in favor of a full return, but had a reservation around April break travel and are advocating a delay. The increase in traffic within Hopkinton has been a long-term trend, but many students feel a full return would further increase traffic at peak times. Another point made by students was confusion around scheduling um, around lunchtime in specifically. Um, thank you for listening for those student voices and I'll pass it to Colby to share the opposing view. Thank you, Henry. 15% um, of the student responses were in favor of a full return. Uh, the responses addressed quite a few issues that the full return model will solve. These students believe the quality of education for in-person students will improve with the full return. Uh, some of those students pointed to the hybrid model as a catalyst for laziness and procrastination for students. Uh, while other students voiced their excitement to see their friends after the full return and pointed to that as a possible solace from a year of isolation. A popular rebuttal to the opposed idea that the proposed full, full return schedule will not be safe is that the school did a great job with the hybrid model and they expect the school will do a great job with the full return model as well. Now, the remaining 3% of students uh, wrote neutral comments, often speaking to both sides. However, a lot of these also showed how confused kids were and how they had questions on how the return would work in many, many ways. A few questions that we got um, really revolved around schedules and lunch, like Henry just said, uh, as well as how remote students could possibly switch to in-person learning on April 26th. Uh, I think that just shows that we need to get the word out to students a little bit more. I know all that information is readily available for us, but obviously not everyone has seen it and that's still an issue. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you both for conducting that survey. Uh, was that something that you helped orchestrate with school council or student council? Student council did that as a group. Um, I mean, we had the idea to get like input from students during a seniors meeting, I believe. Um, I can't really remember exactly which meeting that came from, but 
we had the idea that uh, student voices needed to be heard more than they were. And so we sent out a survey trying to collect those voices with the intent to bring the responses to this meeting. Thank you so much. Really, really valuable to hear from you. I appreciate it. Um, committee members, what questions do you have for our guests? Hi, yes, I had a question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering, do you, do you have a spread of the grades? So did you see any like uh, difference between grades and their, their concern about coming back to school? Oh, I'll, I'll let Colby take it. <laughs> Uh, we did not ask students for their grades. Um, some students did specify their grades in their responses, uh, specifically seniors. Uh, there were some senior responses and they varied in the fact that I felt most seniors, like more than other grades, um, wanted to not go full back, saying that it, they felt it was like almost ridiculous to go full back for such a short period of time and that to learn a new schedule for only about a month, actually exactly a month, exactly a month, they thought that was um, like unfair, uh, an unfair way to end their senior year. Thank you, by the way, this is a lot of good work. We really appreciate hearing this data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, sure, I, I have a question for Colby. Since one of your points, uh, and you, you interpreted one of the pieces of, um, feedback being um, communication. Uh, maybe not, not everything that we've communicated here or the superintendent has communicated has filtered through to all the relevant audiences. Do you have suggestions on helping get the word out, for example, on some of the questions you, you saw that you, you compared against statements made? Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about that myself. Um, I mean, I've seen emails come from administration at the high school, and for me, that's exactly what I would be looking for. Uh, but for other students, that's what they say to me. I think it would be down to maybe one day while we're in school, having teachers explain exactly what's going to happen when we come back. We do that a couple days in a row, catch kids and explain if we can get enough the information that way, possibly more kids can rely on students and students. Great, thank you. And Amanda, I mean, I guess for the full audience, is there a place people should go on the website to find information about reopening? Why, yes, there is. <laughs> um, so I, th I don't know, Dr. Kevin, are you going to cover that in your uh, report? Can't say it enough. Yeah, so one thing that I will say is that we do have a frequently asked questions document that is going on the website if it's not already there. But at this point, I think that families should be looking to the building principals because now the building principals know, you know, exactly who's coming back, who's not coming back. They're getting a sense of what those schedules are going to look like. If there are any teacher switches, they'll have a, a very good sense of, you know, a different teacher. Um, I think at the high school, the schedule is not changing. Um, you have a, a what's a 14 day schedule now because you have an A day and an A day and then a B day and a B day. It'll just go to a seven day schedule so that you have an A day, a B day, a C day. So that that really won't change so much for for high school kids. If you're transitioning from remote into hybrid into full time or from hybrid into remote, you you may have some teachers that you see different. Um, but my understanding is that the numbers of kids going from remote in full time or from hybrid out to remote, those numbers are pretty small. But Mr. Bishop can help you for sure. Yeah, thanks. Really interesting update. Thank you both. Thank you for having us. Meg, did you have anything? You, you good? Nancy? No, just great. Love hearing from the students. Thank you. Yeah, but thank you for taking the initiative, you and your colleagues. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's very helpful for us to have you um, give us sort of the boots on the ground reaction to um, sort of what's happening. So thank you, Nancy. Just want to say that was interesting to hear and thank you both for coming. It always, uh, it, it always brightens our meetings to have student voices here. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Feel free to stick around, but if you have homework and you know other things to do, feel free to drop off. We <laughs> we fully understand. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Parson, I think we are turning to you now for the 
February Vacation Career Speaker Series. Yes, thank you. And I'll invite Valerie, oh, there's Valerie to join us. Thanks, Valerie. And I will share my screen. Perfect. Um, so Valerie and I are here tonight to talk a little bit about what um, she has titled the Career Speaker Series, which took place this past February, just a few weeks ago at our high school. And so we'll start, we'll both uh, be part of this presentation. I'll start going through some of the slides and Valerie, please jump in um, whenever you'd like. And um, Valerie is really the person who spearheaded this um, this initiative with our students. So we definitely uh, wanna make sure that we hear from her tonight as well. Um, so just to start with a little bit of history, how did we get here to this February, 2021 um, career speaker series for our students? Um, a year ago, if you remember, Dr. Kavanaugh wrote a STEAM grant. And as part of that grant, we were able to bring Valerie and her expertise out of retirement um, from Hopkinton High School's science department and um, as one of our SMLs and a chemistry teacher. And she did quite a bit of work in the area of STEAM instruction last year, um, including creating um, an in-person job shadowing program last winter. And this year, through another grant um, that I was able to um, receive for Hopkinton, the CBTE, uh, we were able to bring Valerie back for another year working with us. And this year, her title shifted to, quote, job shadowing coordinator. Um, as you can imagine, we found it uh, somewhat challenging to run a job shadowing program in the middle of a pandemic. And um, certainly there were many conversations about can we, should we, would it be allowable to bring kids into workplaces and um, whether or not part of it was through our hesitation, concern for health and safety. Likewise, the job sites had the same concerns for students' health and safety. So um, really through Valerie's persistence and her commitment, job shadowing um, 2021 was kind of redefined as a career speaker series. And so tonight we'll tell you a little bit about that. There we go. Um, so again, we couldn't bring the students to the jobs, but Valerie was able to bring the jobs to our students. And she was able to secure 24 professionals who were willing to share their career and or educational expertise with our students over vacation and kudos as a number of our experts shared kudos to our students for giving of their time on a week when you know I think everybody was really ready for a February break this year for sure um, but a lot of dedicated students had a lot of interest in this um, 70 students all together from the high school spanning all four grades participated in the sessions and I think Valerie um, has highlighted this and took great pride in the fact that 12 of the experts were actually HHS alumni nine were Hopkinton residents, and each session hosted between one and 15 students. So in terms of what the career sessions involved, um, Valerie was very, she's a very detail-oriented um, educator, and she put together a very nicely structured format. So she made it incredibly easy for the experts to um, know how to share their expertise with the students and get to learn a little bit about the students as well. So they were presented with a format that they did their best to follow. And I think what Valerie and I both noticed and were very pleased with was not only did the experts share information with our students about the careers, but each one of them seemed to be able to attach some sort of lesson about work ethic, per career preparation, um, you know, what happens when things don't follow the path that you originally had charted for yourself? You know, how do you overcome obstacles that um, inevitably will come your way. Um, so you can see some of the topics that they addressed. Um, and I think I just kind of shared some of them with you. One of the things that um, Valerie helped me highlight here was kind of the future outlook. You know, what's, what's up and coming in your field? Where, where is it now? And what do you see in terms of students who are really thinking ahead and beginning to plan for their future? Some of the professions that were represented, there were many, many, as you can see, um, from things in the medical field through um, a realtor, um, TV writers, business and finance, law, 
engineering was definitely a heavily um, attended um, session. Um, we had representation from the Hopkinton Laborers Union, um, graphic artists, um, et cetera. Um, we noted that we, we thought there might be some interest in cosmetology and um, you know, we will continue to promote careers through this work that may that certainly um, you know will drive our students down a four-year <clears throat> college path, but those that will support students in alternative pathways as well. And I know you you heard me talk about that in a number of our meetings as well. Um, Valerie, do you want to jump in here and maybe talk about some of the things that are in addition to what happened over February break? Um, sure. Um, in, in addition to the speaker series, we've also been recording uh, Zoom interviews with a number of professionals that are going to be shared with the students and with the guidance department as well as the faculty. And um, so I think this will give students in the future, you know, we're trying to have some longevity to this and addressing current students through the February vacation was, was great and very well received by the professionals as well as the students. But um, uh, Jen and Carol and I always looking for different ways to sort of um, carry this forward. So one of the things we're doing, as I said, is uh, videotaping, I'm videotaping Zoom interviews that I'm doing with professionals from, in all professions, from the trades all the way to um, those with advanced degrees. And I think we're well over 70 videos at this point. I suspect by the end of the school year, we'll probably have a bank of about 100 videos. And so I've been sharing those with the uh, with the faculty as I go, appropriate faculty members, and they've already been having a pretty large impact. So I'm really, really pleased on how well they've been received. So um, Jen's, I am identified some of the things here that have been um, a result of the videos, but also some other things that we've been doing. So um, let's see, the first bullet there in January, we held an after school Zoom session where students had the opportunity to talk to um, uh, representative from Griffin Electric, I think in Holliston about their apprentice program. I think we had five students attend that. Um, we are going to hold another session like the February session over April vacation and again include um, representatives from the various trades. We're also going to have a session on April 1st with a representative from the Navy. So we've had one student sign up for that. Um, as I said, I've been sharing the videos with different faculty members and guidance counselors as we've been making them. And one of them was with a data scientist and the math department um, had Carla um, was so impressed with the, um, the data scientist that they had the data scientist then zoom into a math department meeting. And so she was sharing her career with the, the teachers. And we've had a couple of the scientists um, zoom in and talk to STEM club meetings, um, students as well. Um, at the end of the February vacation event, I did survey the students to get some feedback from them. All of the students said they were um, pleased that they had participated. I, I don't remember if it was mentioned, but the sessions were 30 minutes long. 98% um, of the students said that if we held it again, they'd be interested in participating. So that sort of was the impetus for for doing it again. And um, the, the time frame seemed about right to the majority of the students. Um, uh, Jen has captured some of the comments from the survey from the students. So one said the session helped me break the stereotypical image of software engineering and get a better understanding of, of what life would be like. Another, it was nice to get a feel for where I could go if I chose an art-based career. Another, I've always had an interest in screenwriting and attending the session encouraged me to pursue it while giving me tips on how to. Uh, the information she gave on what you need to do to study abroad in the UK was great. The way she talked about what she was studying made me consider following a similar route, even though I've never heard of political science before. I came up with questions and wrote notes as we went. I enjoyed the questions other people were asking because that made me get a new perspective on things and made me more curious. I really enjoyed the experience. So some of the things that we're working on now, as I've mentioned, um, I just sent out some invitations to some different experts for the April vacation event. So once we get uh, feedback from them and which ones will be available, we'll start scheduling students. Um, I've mentioned the expert videos that we've been recording. 
that we'll continue to make accessible to the faculty and uh, staff and students. Um, oh, I also have been uh, in highlighting a career and including the videos in the weekly student memo. So that's another way students have been able to access them already this year. Um, in terms of increasing awareness about different post-secondary pathways, we're also working on a document that'll be shared on the website, probably in the guidance department um, section of the website, but it's going to provide information to students and guidance counselors on all the different unions that are out there and the different apprenticeship programs and how to get into those, which was something that Lee Greco had specifically asked us to focus on. Um, I also uh, reached out to seniors, asking seniors if they would be interested in uh, finding a local expert to help advise them on their senior project. And I've had five seniors reach out to me in, for that. And so I've been connecting those five seniors with um, different experts in Hopkinton. Um, and I think that's most of it. I can't remember what Jen has next. Oh, questions. Oh, I guess that's most of it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. There's a, a lot here. I'm sure. Um, I don't know if we need the screen share. Yeah. I'm no, sure many no. members have uh, things to ask. Who wants to start? Meg. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to thank you for doing this. It's such a gift to all the students, especially the ones who are beginning su to suspect that the traditional pathway may not be for them. Um, and I just love all the offerings you've brought to them. And I wish I'd had something similar in high school. So thank you so much for your knowledge and your generosity. Meg, I will tell you, um, and thank you for sharing that, that Valerie probably won't say this, but in some cases where she had some very strong connections with the school, she knew there were some students who had signed up who maybe weren't necessarily going to follow through. And she made a lot of outreach to our families and to our students, uh, reminders, um, wake up calls, things like that to ensure that students attended sessions that we, we thought they'd really appreciate. That's great. That personal connection is so important and we're lucky to have it here. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And, and to one of your points, I have, that is the response I've been getting from all these experts that I reach out to in the middle of the, all this craziness we're all in right now. They all say exactly that. Boy, I wish we had something like this. When I was in high school, I would love to have learned more about different careers. So I've just been overwhelmed, not only by all the local experts in Hopkinton that have given up their, their time to do these recordings, but also our graduates oh, the exciting things they're doing out there and they're all so excited to give back. And many have said to me, oh, I've been wanting to come back to Hopkinton and share my experience. So they're so grateful to, to be able to, to give back in that way. Leah? Yeah, so as someone who actually ran a big data competition for high schools in a previous life and had a child, uh, well, not a child, a senior come up to me and go, oh, I'm going into the actuarial sciences and I'm really excited that this was presented to me, which as a senior, I never would have even thought of that as a career path. Um, I'm extremely excited to see both the kind of data science angle and the graphic design angle, right? Because artist kids don't always know the career path that they can take. And so showing them graphic design, showing them the, the I saw art director for gaming company. Like I, I'm amazed and extremely happy that the kids get to have this broad exposure to so many different things, because I think that's part of what sometimes keeps kids from going down a career path they would love is just not knowing, right? Um, so thank you very, very much. Well, you're, you're welcome. And the, the 24 that participated in the February vacation are just a section of the 70 something that have done videos. So the videos we have sheet metal workers and iron workers and plumbers, you know, all the way to pathologists and MD, PhDs, Air Force pilots, you know, it, it runs the gamut. Nancy or Joe? I, I just was thinking how remarkable it is to be able to expose kids to so many different career paths that it, for them to be able to find the way that they're going to be most successful in something that grabs their attention, their interest, and helps them to find a path 
post post high school as well. So thank you. You're, you're welcome. The other thing I wanted to mention about the videos is that as I send them to the teacher, so if I, if I interview an environmental engineer, I might send it to um, Ms. Shire, right? The AP environmental science teacher, or in some cases, um, Kristen Fournier, if it has to do with computer science or something, or Doug for engineering. But anyway, the, the teacher's response have been great too, because not only is it showing them, it giving them an opportunity to show students real world applications of what they're teaching, because even if they're not using it to show the career, which they could, but they can also show those real world applications. But it's also like teachers finding local experts who can mentor students on projects or serve as a judge at the science fair or the art fair. And so I'm really hoping that the side effect of this is going to be um, increasing the um, uh, opportunities to connect the school with the community. Amanda, if I could add to on that last point, that's that's what I my takeaway is. This is another example. We had one last week too, but this is another example of where Hopkins Schools can increase its connections to the community, and that only increases the goodwill the community has back to the schools. And it's also great to see uh, your examples of the return that we get from the Hopkins school system as as students report back years later what they've done. Uh, I also liked that um, you uh, are covering a range of topics. You mentioned art and screenwriting. Uh, while coding and gaming is a hot area in software engineering, we don't all have to end up in that space. And there's still a range of things people should be exposed to. I really think that your kickoff in February was kind of the platform, but these videos that you're talking about are going to live on and be used as content in classroom and outside of the class. And I think it's a great uh, asset to have. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. And if anyone knows anyone that would be interested in doing it, have them email me. So we're still still trying to get that range of careers. As in anyone anyone watching can email. If you don't have Ms. Lachansky's uh, email address, you can always email the central office and we'll put you in touch for sure. And I just have to add, I mean, I love absolutely everything about this. And I think you must have been in retirement for like two seconds because <laughs> I think both my kids had you, loved you. And, um, you know, I can't imagine that you stopped running since you were in the classroom, like you're just always moving things forward. And uh, with our students' interests in mind all the time, I just, I love it all. I love that it's, um, like as everyone else said, targeting each and every student, you're meeting each and every student where they are and showing them places they didn't even know they could go. You know, that it, I think it's, it's such a gift. And um, I think as Meg said, if I could have done that, if I could do that today, I think I might sit in. <laughs> but if I could have done that uh, in high school, absolutely, um, I would have done it. I think it alleviates stress also for kids to hear from people who have graduated, maybe gone to college or maybe gone to an apprenticeship and they've created lives and it, there's so much stress in high school that 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 next step choice is the be all and end all. And I think when you talk to professionals, you realize that life is a journey and not everything is a straight line. And if you haven't done calculus in high school, you can do it later. You can do it in college. And if you don't really want to go to college, you can have a fabulous career as an electrician or a technician or, you know, so it's a gift. And I'm so thankful. And thank you for joining us tonight as well. Well, thank you very much. It's it's a thrill to still be part of the Hopkinton community. <laughs> I'm not ready to leave yet, so. Yeah. Well, we should probably thank Ms. Parson as well. I mean, you're sort of sitting there, you know, but thank you. you know, I know that you were a big part of this as well, so thank you. Valerie is all of the feet on the ground, so she did an amazing job. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right. Good luck with April. Thanks. All right. Thank um, you very much. We'll, we'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye, Valerie. Bye. So fun. All right. All right, Ms. Rosmick. Financial report. Is it going to be as fun as that? <laughs> oh, you're on mute. So I'm going to say no, it probably won't be <laughs> as exciting. Um, would you like me to share my screen and show the first page? If you wouldn't mind, just for the community, that would be great. Okay, 
So just a quick uh, report through the, the middle of March, if you will. Right now, we are running at a slight deficit uh, variance. Right now, you can see from the top, we're running a positive variance with payroll, but a negative variance with our expenses. Um, this is you know, still something that we watch and really are on top of and you know, going over our budget to actuals um, in each department is, as frequently as possible. Um, so as you can see, the, the, the piece that is putting us in a deficit right now being our expenses, um, the distance learning is something that we've talked about early on uh, with our additional VHS and, and tech uh, classes, and then also increasing our legal expenses. Um, you can see where athletics is, has run in the positive as well as transportation. Um, I do expect that uh, positive uh, variants for athletics to continue to grow as, as we know our um, athletics have had to really look different this year according to the MIA guidelines around COVID. So that number will um, continue to grow in, in, a, in a positive way. So that will help with the, the slight um, deficit variance of, of where we are now. Um, so I, I'm still confident that we will bring the budget in uh, balanced and, and not in a deficit position, looking at a more long-term. Thank you. Questions, comments? I have a question, Amanda. Sure. Um, do we have any um, insight yet on application of you know, the federal funds that just came through? and other sources, maybe through the state, and how that will affect things on the revenue um, side? So the, the money that has been allocated right now, I think we talked about um, probably at a previous meeting, so that we're looking at as potential being used for pool testing and other items that are not in the budget right now. Um, so in terms of the relief of the deficit variance, if that's what you're looking for, Joe, that would not be the, um, the focus, <coughs> excuse me. It would be for additional staffing that are not in this um, right now. All right, thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Okay, so I guess we just keep an eye on that and we'll uh, get the next report. And you know, please let us know if you see things not um, coming back into, into the black. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, superintendent's report. Okay. Get myself back to the beginning. All right, so this is the superintendent's report for the school committee meeting of March 18th, 2021. Um, just a very quick thank you to the students in Mrs. David Schofer's classroom at the Hopkins School. Thank you to the kids in room 110. I enjoyed being their community reader this morning and we read one plastic bag. It was a great day to be with the kids. And they did a great job and we had our dialogue about that text afterward. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of an enrollment update. I know that we keep saying that we hardly ever see these kinds of numbers enrolled in kindergarten. As of today, we had 155 students who had enrolled in kindergarten in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So keep them coming and there are plenty of them out there, it seems. Uh, just one more slide on enrollment. Um, you can just see where we were on February 25th and where we are now on March 18th, um, our net for this year was 81 on the 25th of February, and today it is 85 additional students. And as you know, we keep um, we continue to say that we anticipated having 4,111 students. We are not near 4,111 students right now, um, so you know we're probably down about uh, just a little bit under 100 from where we thought we might be. But 
Um, you know, kids keep trickling in day in and day out. And what we're hearing from the elementary principals is as they're trying to place the kids who are going from hybrid to remote and remote to in person, um, they're also, you know, placing students who are coming to us from the outside at the same time. Um, a COVID-19 update, and I will, I'll spend some time here tonight because I think that, you know, we've heard a lot from people in the community about their concerns with COVID-19. Um, the slide on the left, the box on the left, tells you that we have recently had an uptick in cases. And I know that this is the kind of thing that is making uh, families very concerned about the full-time return to school. So from March 2nd through March 17th, a 15-day span, we did have a seven adults in our community test positive, 26 in-person students test positive, and one remote student test positive. Um, so you can see that we have 34 students who, oh, 34 people in the community who have tested positive in that 15 day period, which for Hopkinton is an enormous number. And I know people keep saying, you know, is that happening in school? How are we sure that it's not happening in school? And maybe it's just helpful if I talk a little bit about what contact tracing actually entails. So once we find out that a student is positive, um, what we do is we reach out to that family and by we, I really mean our school nurses and they ask us you know, a whole series of questions. So questions such as, you know, where have you traveled recently? Have you been around someone who is positive? Have you been somewhere with your family? And you know, typically the, the nurses can identify a place where, where that person um, did in fact become COVID positive. And so what, what will happen is, is this, um, say for example, you know, um, Mrs. Parson and I invite Mrs. Fargiano and Mr. Markey into central office, for example, for lunch. And we can only invite school to school committee members because we don't want to violate open meeting law. And when we do, we sit at you know one of the round tables in our offices and we take our masks off and we enjoy our lunch, but we are certainly closer than six feet in that setting. And so imagine that that afternoon I start feeling unwell and then I start to realize I've got this cough and a sneeze, I'm running a low grade temp and I, I call my primary care doctor, the doctor sends me for testing and I turn out to be positive. Immediately, Mrs. Fargiano, Mr. Markey and Mrs. Parson all become close contacts. If two days later, Mrs. Parson tests positive for COVID, what happens then is in terms of contact tracing, it's presumed that Mrs. Parson contracted that virus from me because there was an opportunity for the two of us to be in a place, masks off, and she's considered to be a close contact. Now, I know people would say, well, that doesn't absolutely positively guarantee that she got it from you. And that's true, it does not. I mean, Mrs. Parson could have been walking in the high school and there could have been a person there who had their mask off and that person could have been COVID positive and that person could have sneezed and the droplets from that sneeze could have gotten on Mrs. Parsons mucosa unbeknownst to her. But what, what happens with contact tracing is it's really a, a situation of likelihood. Are you a close contact to someone and can we trace it back somewhere? And I don't want you to think that I, as the superintendent, are, make, are making these decisions. I'm not. Our school nurses work very closely with the Board of Health, and the Board of Health is the regulatory authority. So when the Board of Health says to me, Superintendent Carol Kavanaugh, you have a situation in your middle school where you have uh, transmission of the virus in school. You had a kid in math class, period two. She was COVID positive for two days. And now the kid who sits to the right of her in that math class is also COVID positive. Then I say, okay, fair enough. We have a transmission of the virus in school. At this point in time, the public health officials and school nurses will tell you that they've only discovered that to have happened one time. Now, could it have happened other times? It could have. But what I'm saying is that as we're doing contact tracing, what we're finding is more that story that I just shared with you about people who were eating lunch together or people who were playing an unsanctioned out of school sport with each other or someone in a family who traveled and visited another family member when somebody turned up positive. Those are the kinds of things that the Board of Health and the school nurses would say, we have a confirmation here 
that it did not happen in our public schools. And we see a lot of that. So I know that people say, how can it possibly be? But one of the things that the commissioner will say, and there is a, a recent report out that compares three feet to six feet, is that we're really not seeing transmission of the virus in schools. And I know you can hold me accountable for it if you like, but I get my information from medical professionals and I just share it with the community. Um, and I know people would, would like more transparency. So on the Hopkinton Public Schools website, families can now find a COVID-19 dashboard. Uh, one of our school nurses will continue to update that um, almost daily. And the district is now looking into conducting pool testing. And I know folks have also said, why haven't you um, taken part in the, the state pool testing that is free? I think that the, the actual testing, when you take the swab to the lab, that part of the testing is in fact free, but the courier service to get it there, which is about $15,000 is not for free. Hiring the personnel to ensure that you've got someone overseeing permission slips and record keeping and communicating with the nurses and um, having kids come down and getting swabbed and batching the swabs. That's an awful lot of work that would require the hiring of personnel. So I, I just want to be clear that when people say it's free, there, there's a very small portion of that that is in fact free. It, it does come with a cost, but the district is willing to, to make this cost um, because I think that it will, you know, certainly help people to understand um, you know, whether or not there are um, asymptomatic positives in our schools. And, and that will, I think, bring a comfort to a lot of families. So I did want to spend a little bit of time there so that you have a sense of, of our thinking on this and some of the, the data that we are currently working with. Uh, I know that people are very concerned about students and staff who are currently quarantined. As of today, these are our quarantine numbers. At Marathon, we have three staff and three students who are quarantined. At Elmwood, there is no staff and two students who are quarantined. At Hopkins, there's four staff and five students who are quarantined. At the middle school, one staff and 13 students who are quarantined. And at the high school, four staff and 74 students who are quarantined. Uh, when we talk about quarantine students, some of the or staff, some of these people could be people who are COVID positive and others could be close contacts. And so I think it's really important that we have this conversation about how is it that you get to be a close contact? Because the presumption might be that all of the people here who are quarantined as close contacts are close contacts because of a contact in school. And that's not necessarily accurate. So if we had a student, for example, who played a club sport and someone on their club sport team became a positive, that student would become a close contact and be sitting out of school because of their affiliation with the sport. Or say that a student lives in a household where one of the parents became positive, say, for example, at work. Um, then that student and any of his siblings become close contact and they too are sitting out of school. So. Uh, probably gone a long way to say that these students and these staff who are in quarantine, it could be because of an exposure at school, certainly, but it also could be an exposure in an activity, an exposure at home. And so these numbers reflect all of that. Um, the, the nurses do keep track of all of the students who are quarantined and you know it can even happen due to travel. If someone has gone to Florida and has returned and their PCR test results aren't back yet, they could also be in this mix right here. Um, so I used March 2nd as our last marker, and I did because I think that's the last time I had presented this data. At that time, you could see we had 29 adults, 88 students in person, and 10 students who were remote who had been at some point in time from September to March 2nd COVID positive, and our total was 127. And to be honest with you, that was kind of a badge of honor, I think, for Hopkinton that we had kept our COVID positive numbers so, so low. Um, when I would meet with other superintendents um, as part of the um, kind of Metro West group, the tech groups or the accept groups that, that we belong to, um, many, many of them had numbers that were significantly higher. And in the last 15 days, you can see what has happened in Hopkinton. We have gone to 36 adults, 114 students in person, and 11 remote students, so only one additional remote student. But we've also seen more in-school transmission um, among adults. We currently have five adult to adult in-school transmissions, one at Elmwood, two at the high school, one at the district level, and one at Marathon. 
And we still continue to have only one verified transmission of the virus at school. And when I say verified, what I mean is that the Hopkinton Board of Health in, condition, in conjunction with the school nurses have said that is considered to be an in-school transmission, just so that we were very clear on what that means. All right, and I think unless there are questions um, at this point about any of that data, I will move on to the um, 10 year planning that we've been doing with the town of Hopkinton. Dr. Kavanaugh, maybe we just pause for just a second because there was a lot there. Um, there was. Does anyone have anything they want to ask about the COVID topic, quarantining cases, et cetera? I can't see everybody for some reason, so speak up if you want. <laughs> I guess we're good. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right, so uh, Mr. Kamalo, our town manager, has recently put together a group of people who are taking a look at um, the Hopkinton pu Public Schools. Um, and what we have here is just kind of a five-year projection, um, but I believe that the town is doing some 10-year planning. Um, so when we, we met with them, we started with the uh, who we are in the Hopkinton Public Schools, and clearly we have a mission statement and we have um, some values, and we also have a statement of vision. And our statement of vision says that the Hopkinton Public School District is regarded by other school districts, institutions of higher learning, and employers as a center of educational innovation that produces critical thinkers, creative problem solvers, effective communicators, and productive healthy citizens. And the way that we meet that vision uh, is through the, the statements that you see numbered one to seven also in that box. And what I wanna do is kind of isolate statement number three, the school district's facilities, grade configuration and organizational structure support student learning. Um, this is something that we're going to really be looking at over the next five to 10 years. And it's important that we do that because as you know, we're always talking about enrollment and how we are outgrowing very rapidly if we haven't already outgrown our public schools. Simultaneously each year, we take this vision and mission and we create what is called our strategic objectives. And so what we're going to be looking at are our st strategic objectives for 2021 in the Hopkinton Public Schools. We start with three sort of great big buckets, our planning for enrollment growth, valuing individual pathways, sort of that notion that our kids can individually all become what they need to be. And I think, you know, tonight, Mrs. Lachansky and Mrs. Parson, their presentation, I think, speaks to that. Um, and then building school communities of collaboration. So in that vein, under our plan for enrollment growth, you can see that we have some highlighted text over here. And what that highlighted text says uh, for 2021 is that we are in the process of establishing a facility study group to examine facility development needs alongside student growth projections. Um, another thing that we are doing during this year is monitoring the Elmwood SOI. And you know that we had originally planned to see that, that statement of interest come back to us as either a yes or a no from the Mass School Building Authority sometime in December, what they're projecting. I think I've touched on a few of these, um, but we do have a lot of transitions between schools. You know, a, a kiddo gets to the marathon school, has two years, and they're just kind of getting acclimated to that school when poof, they find themselves at Elmwood. 50% of our elementary schools uh, population are turning over every year. So it's even hard, I think, for our building principals to make those kinds of really lovely connections with kids because they just get to know them and then suddenly they're, they're heading out the door. Um, but we do not really have right now a kind of state-of-the-art fine and performing arts center. We've got space for that and what's currently our middle school, but we certainly don't have um, the, the quality of space that we would love to see. We could build on trans and interdisciplinary studies, um, student services that address the whole child. Uh, we are looking at resources for advanced learning programs. You know, we are always trying to meet the needs of all of our learners for multicultural programming and certainly to build communities of collaboration. Um, I am going to ask Mrs. Rothamick to talk a little bit about some of the pricing that she has done with um, space and building spaces in our district. So um, Susan, I will hand this over to you now. Okay, thank you. So in terms of trying to really look forward in, you know, what is that price tag? So if we're looking 10 years out in the potential of 700 students, 10 years out, what, what would that mean um, from a 
facility standpoint. And again, this is really taking the information that we have at this time, this is not an in-depth study, using those slides that Dr. Kavanaugh just presented in terms of where do we have deficits in terms of space within the buildings. And this is using the MSBA square footage at the maximum peak enrollment. So if you look at each building, you can see that each building has a significant deficit in terms of square footage and when you add that all up between our five buildings, that's 187,000 square feet um, that we are short in terms of this enrollment plan or growth. And then if you're looking at the replacement of the Elmwood School, that's another 86,000 square feet. So looking at those two pieces, uh, typically we would use about a $500 per square foot for uh, building and for construction. And that, that is a, uh, a generous um, number, uh, but to just, again, at that 40,000 foot, what are we looking at for cost? So just to address the deficit level would be $93 million. Uh, replacement of an Elmwood school in kind would be the 43 million. And then of course, we've also talked about a renovation uh, to the middle school. So the middle school would probably be the building that at this point in time would really need to have a lot of surfaces touched. And that we would look at probably a cost per square foot of around 150,000. Uh, and so this brings you up in a, in a 10 year outlook of a potential of about $157 million of construction costs that we could be looking at. And, and this is, you know, this is kind of what that long-term growth uh, or um, capital planning we did with the town was to put a number on it. And so that's what we did here. But another way of looking at it would be um, if you go to the next slide. So if we were, and this is just one option, if we were to take the two buildings, Elmwood and Hopkins together, if we were invited into the MSBA process and we're able to move forward with the potential of a two to five. And again, this would be addressing some of those um, areas that Dr. Kavanaugh spoke about. One, of course, being all the transitions that we do for our youngest learners. So if we were making a two to five school, then th those transitions um, start to go away. So taking that full amount of square footage at 219,000 um, at $500 a square feet brings you up to a $109 million um, project. And again, this is gross. So if this was an MSBA project, you'd have to factor in what the reimbursement would be for MSBA. That would bring that, that cost down of what it would actually cost for the town. So then if we were able to do this, then what would be the opportunity of taking those last three buildings and combining that square footage? Now you're looking at between the three buildings, a deficit of 31,000 square feet. And how do you allocate that to get at addressing between those three buildings? And something that I didn't mention on the previous slide, when you think about the amount of square footage that needs to be added to each building, we don't have the space, contiguous space to a building to add that amount of square footage to each building, which is why you have to start looking at the buildings um, kind of all together and taking all that square feet and kind of reallocating it in what makes the most sense. So between the three buildings, Hopkins Middle School and the high school, you probably could find contiguous space to add 31,000 between those three buildings and that would attain your, your deficit. And then looking at the marathon, the marathon is what it is. Um, as we keep saying, it's, it's an early learning center. It will stay your K-1 school. Uh, so that, that deficit on that campus would have to be addressed. So, and then of course the middle school again. So interestingly, just looking at your buildings differently for the same price tag, you end up with a brand new two to five 
you end up with the area um, around your other campus buildings to be able to add on and address those deficits. So strategically, that you know, these are the the recommendations or the things that we are looking to get out of a district planning study. Um, but this is just to kind of put in context what we are looking at over the next 10 years with the potential influx of 700 students. How do we take our square footage? How do we make it the most advantageous for the community, for the students? Um, and so that's a process that we'll be looking forward to doing. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. We are running a little behind, so um, didn't know how much more on this topic you have, or if you want to take questions, or you want to finish up. Okay. No, this is the this is the last slide, and I think probably everything on this slide we probably have already said. So I'm very happy to take questions. I just want to ask if you could just sort of step back just to reframe. This came about. This discussion is happening tonight because. There was a municipal leaders meeting um, last week, I think, right? Um, so I think uh, the town manager and um, I believe it was the town manager who brought in a, a consultant to run a process to, to go through a 10 year projection um, for the municipal leaders who are people like Dr. Kavanaugh, but for every um, sort of department and cost center in the district. So, I mean, in the town. So, including Parks and Rec and including um, um, Department of Public Works and every every area uh, budget area or cost center has a municipal leader who presented a vision and so I think um, Dr. Kavanaugh I, I was able to attend with you but I did not you were not able to present these slides you gave them a number at that time um, if I'm not mistaken if you could just talk to that just a little bit so people understand why we're talking about this now Sure, yes. So I, I, as uh, I may have said at the start, Mr. Kamalu did invite all of our, our town leaders. And you know, it, it was an interesting meeting because there were some people who said over the next five years, I'm just going to need personnel or I'll need three fire trucks, those kinds of things. But I think that the schools really were, you know, the people who had an enormous price tag on our needs. And um, you know, I, I think that that might be sort of the best way to describe it, but I think Mr. Kamalo did a really nice job of getting us a, a consultant to kind of guide this work. And I know that this is part of sort of his strategic planning as well going forward. And we have obviously in our capital, our capital projects for this year, we have um, a project to look at campus planning. Yes, we do. And in addition on the marathon school as well. Yeah. So committee members, what questions or comments do you have? There's a lot here. Amanda, I, I just want to thank uh, Mrs. Rothermich because uh, she was very involved in the Marathon School project too, and uh, very good to have her expertise there. And now, as we look to the future on how we can continue to deliver the high quality education that Hopkinton has come to expect amidst all this possible enrollment growth, um, I'm glad to have Mrs. Rothermich on board with her experience. And uh, I think it's, it's a great idea to have this um, planning get underway. I, I recall we first actually started talking about it. There was a meeting back in November of 2019 where this kind of vision was first kind of floated um, publicly. And it's good to see some follow up. And, and we'll see how enrollment turns out this fall. But, it, you know, over the, the trend seems pretty clear, regardless of what the starting point is today. Thank you. Thank you. Leah? Hi, yes. Uh, like Joe said, this is amazing. I'm so happy that we are getting this underway, that uh, Susan and Carol are working so hard to get these projections. Um, we're talking 10 years. In some ways, you know, I totally get it. They're big capital improvements. But in other ways, that concerns me a little bit because then I'm like, OK, well, which of those yellow classrooms are turning red in the next year, right? And which of those green classrooms are transitioning to yellow or red? And how do we prioritize to ensure that, you know, things don't end up really in a, in a poor place in certain areas while we work to try to get this very kind of efficient good model working? Is that what the capital study 
is going to help us with, like what what priorities we should have and what things are going to need to be tackled first to make sure that our students are never kind of in a, in a situation where where we're constantly sort of backfilling, right, with the capital. Hopefully that is what it will do for us, Leah. Um, and I feel like, at least in my time in Hopkinton, we've been kind of on that treadmill where we are constantly kind of backfilling, right? Because the enrollment is outpacing our ability to kind of keep up with it. You know, I know that when, when, when we had the ribbon cutting, for example, at the marathon school, I can remember throwing out a number and one of the architects said to me, oh my goodness, you'll never have that many students here. And I think within, you know, 12 months we did. Um, it's just... And of course, MSBA won't let you build something for projected kids. They'll only let you build something for the kids who are here. So yeah, I mean, I think that that's what we've always done. And hopefully this study will help us to see how to use our physical plants, maximize those and maximize some programming and watch our enrollment growth and figure out where those, those bubbles are going to be. Like when will, the, when will second grade have the most kids and when will 10th grade have the most kids and, and those sorts of things. So what we can kind of build to accommodate the movement of the kids. That's wonderful. Thank you. I, I'm looking forward to hearing about that when it happens. <laughs> Nancy? So I'm looking forward to the study and I'm, I'm grateful for all of this visioning that goes into it. I think that um, the study will be great at helping us kind of put this out in a clear way for our community. $157 million is probably a little bit shocking for people at home that have maybe aren't as familiar with some of the constraints that we have. So I think having that to fall back on to really be able to make the case of whether we, you know, we're going to need that amount of capital or, you know, if there are areas that we're able to appreciate some efficiencies in down the road. So uh, I, I echo the backfilling. I think in many ways we've had to kick the, the can down the curb many years um, to a problem that is kind of bubbling over now. So thank you. And you know, to your point, um, Nancy, uh, that the number is large. Uh, so now that the, you know, uh, Tim O'Leary and I have already had conversations of looking at the long-term debt schedule and where do you start to see some ebb and flow? You know, right now our, our debt schedule is quite full, but strategically, how do we work with that? Looking at these visions and, you know, try to put the town in a, in a, in a good place, you know, financially moving forward. And I think that's a great conversation and glad that you guys are having that just because I know that the, when a couple of buildings townwide came online at about the same time, we experienced such a, a spike, it seemed like in our debt service that, and I know that's gonna start going down even more over the next couple of years. Is that right? Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, as great as these projected sums are, I feel incredibly relieved that we're returning to it after a year of being made dizzy by the pandemic and all of its insistent and unpredictable needs. Um, so I'm really happy to see these slides, which are very familiar to me in many ways, because We've been talking about this for a long time. And, and I think the longer we delay, the more expensive it's going to be. But we clearly need space for more students in the town. And the, the buildings are, are, are very full as they are. So I hope, I hope we'll have everyone's support. Thanks, Meg. And I, I would just add to that, that I, you know, aside from what everyone else has said, I love that we are considering the priorities for Hopkinton. I mean, we are a town that has for a long time now really been proud of, say, our music program. And, you know, it's, it's we we host MICA, we, you know, we've invested heavily in our, in our music program and we have so many musicians. And I love that you had this sort of strategic slide where you look at sort of the Performing Arts Center. Does that reflect the community's commitment to performing arts? And is that really, aside from maybe not being the right size, because I, we know our band rooms are small and so forth, um, where do we in Hopkinton uh, really want to invest? I mean, we've, we've grown our STEM program, our STEAM programs a lot. Um, do we have the right robotics facility? Does it reflect the priorities of the community? And um, I'm really excited to get to this work uh, as well. So thank you for 
being able to pull this together, thanks to all the work that you guys had done last year uh, with the consultants and, and started this conversation. And, you know, I think it probably put you in a much better place to give good numbers to the um, effort in the middle of this year. And I'm, I'm really appreciative of all the work that you've done here. Do you have any more in your report, Dr. Kavanaugh? That was a nice juicy report. We're blown the agenda off. That's okay. We're, we're a little off schedule, but I think that was really, both of those topics were hugely important to cover. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to do a chair report tonight. I'm sorry to make you go through that, but Dr. Kavanaugh, could you pop my slides up if you don't mind? Um, first, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to make a statement. I, I know I speak on behalf of the whole school committee, so if you just indulge me for a moment. Um, Anti-Asian violence and harassment have been on the rise throughout the pandemic. This week's senseless killings in Atlanta are only the latest tragic example. On behalf of the school committee, we, we condemn these racist acts. The Hopkins of Hope Schools are communities that welcome, value, and celebrate people from all backgrounds and ethnicities. This fall, you may have seen that we as a committee formally pledged to stamp out racism, and we are committed to this work through our collective management of budget, policy, and the ongoing diversity and inclusion goals that we support in uh, Dr. Kavanaugh's goals every year. In addition, this weekend, many of us, along with other municipal leaders, will be participating in the second of two half-day sessions on active bystander training, sponsored by the Hopkins and Freedom Team and presented by Two Story Theater. Um, I personally found the first training to be excellent and I'm very much looking forward to Saturday's session. Trainings like this increase our understanding and give us tools to confront racism and bias when we encounter it, and we're grateful for this opportunity. As a reminder to everybody, the Hopkins Freedom Team has established a hotline for anyone experience, experiencing bias or racism in our community. The number is 774-278-4455. For ongoing regular community engagement, we uh, continue to receive emails, uh, not quite as many as we did before last week's vote, but um, we hear about, as Dr. Kavanaugh said, um, concerns about quarantining students. We did have some questions about before and after care and the fees that are uh, being set there. Um, some concerns about traffic uh, on around the schools when we do reopening and questions about can we have a dashboard uh, to count our cases. And as Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned, if you go to the school website, you can now link from the homepage of any of the schools. There's a, a COVID dashboard link in the, in, in the news section. And I just wanna thank um, the technology department, the nurses, um, and everybody involved in getting that dashboard up. I know that was a quick turnaround and um, I think the community really appreciates the commitment to that transparency. On the public forum FAQs, you're probably wondering where those FAQs I promised you are because they're not out there yet. It's not for lack of effort. Um, the FAQs coming immediately out of the forum, um, some of them have been drafted, although as you know from last week's discussion, uh, the high school model has now shifted a little bit from our original public forum. So we're just kind of buttoning those up and we will be putting out those sort of general FAQs for the community, I'm hoping um, by the end of the weekend. Um, and as Dr. Hep Kavanaugh said, you can always, and most importantly, reach out to your uh, school principals for questions about reopening because now it's getting much more operational. And that's where you're gonna get your specific school-based operational answers that we as a school committee don't have. Next slide, please. Um, I want to put a plug in. I know it's Thursday night and I'm talking about tomorrow morning, but um, Senate President Karen Spilka has a huge um, commitment year on year to mental health. Uh, she's a very personal commitment to this topic through, um, you know, work that she has done and she always uh, sponsors a forum on mental health and we've heard a lot about mental health in the, in the COVID era. So it is not too late, I don't believe. I think you can follow the link um, to Senator Spilka's uh, website to sign up. It's a Zoom uh, mental health forum. It's for families, community leaders, teachers, anyone who's available at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, and there will be some q and A. I know there are going to be some uh, members of the Framingham Public Schools, I believe, who are going to um, do some presentations on this. 
um, and the Rennie Center will be there. So just a plug in if you have time, it's free. If you wanna register, um, it's open to any, any family in our community. I wanna take a moment just on budget for the committee members. Um, so as you know, our operating, operating budget has been submitted and accepted by the town manager um, as we voted it last week uh, by the school committee. Our capital budget has also been submitted. It was presented to the Capital Improvements Committee uh, and they asked questions. If you've never been at one of those sessions before, the Capital Improvements Committee asked a lot of questions about the projects, um, the scope, alternative approaches, et cetera. They, they, they are excellent. They ask a lot of detailed questions. Um, they don't determine what's in and what's out at that time. They just really inquire so that they understand each project. At this point, I think committee members have seen a draft of the annual town meeting uh, warrant, and you'll notice that two of our proposed capital projects were not included. Um, that was the White House renovation, which we put on originally for $206,000, and the wetlands order of condition, which we keep trying to put a bow on this, and um, it's something that we've inherited, as um, Ms. Rodemick has said repeatedly, from a project done well before our time here, but we need to put this um, to bed. So just so committee members know, I have inquired of the town manager and the town CFO if school committee can adjust which projects are brought forward. So there was about $266,000 that were, they weren't able to fund. I completely get the constraints financially that um, the town is facing. But I don't know if either of the two projects that were cut might have been a higher priority for members of the committee. And I don't know if we might have an opportunity to swap out another project for one of our projects that got cut. Um, specifically for me personally, uh, the White House renovation is very important to me. I think we have students in that building um, and the building needs roof work and I think work on the siding and painting as well. So um, Ms. Rodemick has shared that some of that money, the 206,000, we were able to cut that down to about in half because we were able to use some pandemic funds to address the windows and doors because of ventilation. Um, but we do still have a project there that you know might be of interest to school committee. I just wanna, I don't know if we have an opportunity to maybe adjust which of our capital projects were put on the town meeting warrant. I haven't heard back yet, but I have asked because I, I, I don't know that we, we necessarily wanna overlook something like the White House. Um, some options, you know, what we may hear back is that there is time and we can talk about this at an upcoming meeting. We may hear back that the warrant is closed and we can't adjust. We might hear that we could put um, the roof. Maybe uh, we can look into whether we could maybe capture any excess appropriation from the Hopkins Middle School and Middle School roof repairs and replacements. If there's any excess, could we apply that to the White House? We can ask. Um, if all else fails and we do have a change in priorities from what is presented, we as a committee can consider an amendment on the floor at town meeting to something if we want. So I want to share that with you. I don't have information. I don't know if anybody else had looked at the warrant articles and, um, you know, kind of made note of that and thought, gee, I really wish that wetland order of conditions had been funded or, you know, also had concerns about the White House. But we don't set we didn't set that exact priority so i've just inquired i want you to know that i've asked uh, on our behalf next do i have a next slide i think i'm done yeah i think you're done i think i'm done i'm so that's it. Playing, nothing's happening <laughs> <laughs> okay that's it so that's my that's my update for tonight um any comments or questions okay great lisa reports Joe? Um, it's gonna, the timing is going to sound funny, but the uh, Marathon School um, passed its final audit with the MSBA. Uh, there was a whole bunch of uh, long tail activities with the state to close that project out. And it included some conservation commission work as well. Uh, but um, Susan, I don't know if you can give the official update. I, I think that we did pass the MSBA audit, is that right? Yes, so they gave us a draft of the audit and we have gone through it and we have accepted it. So once we pass that back to um, the state, 
as a signed document, then the town would receive its final payment for the project. Great, thank you. That's all. So, uh, sorry uh, to tie that off, Amanda. We will at some point need to disband officially and free these volunteers who <laughs> have put in now eight years of, of service to, to this project. So, um, Susan, I'm sure will let us know once the paperwork gets processed and we're able to then come back to the school committee and select board to disband that committee. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick update from HOP Coalition. Um, we had a meeting this week. We continue to work on the Drug-Free Communities Grant. And um, through our consultant, we worked this week on, we went to breakout groups and worked on action plans um, as components of this grant that we're writing around um, alcohol use and marijuana use. So we were um, coming up with some action plans for those, um, and we will continue to work on that. Um, the goal is to earn the Drug-Free Communities Grant, so it will fund um, programming that will help um, address uh, drug use and misuse uh, among youth. So, any other liaison reports? Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, we have contract tracing, contact tracing and surveillance testing position. Okay. So as we said, we're looking into doing some pool testing. Um, and of course the pool testing will need someone to run that for us. And so what we have, what we're asking from the school committee tonight is to uh, fund a couple of positions, probably a couple of positions. Um, but certainly what would be involved in that is um, assisting the school nurses with contact tracing efforts and assisting with the coordination of surveillance testing. Um, so we will post that position. We've already posted it as an anticipated position at the hourly rate of 25 to $30 an hour. Um, and, you know, we need people who are going to be able to send permission slips, monitor positives, relay information back to the nurses, do a little bit of contact tracing. Um, the nurses, six nurses, five schools are getting exhausted. You saw those close contact numbers tonight, how many people are quarantining. I'm telling you, they're overwhelmed and they're very, very tired. We need to bring someone else on. Um, so the positions will be funded through the ESSER 2 grant. And I may have misled you because the ESSER 2 grant does total $211,000, but these positions won't be $211,000. So if that was uh, worded strangely in my memo, I apologize for that. Um, they will be significantly less, but nonetheless, I am looking for you to approve those positions. Anyone want to make a motion? I make a motion. To I'm jumping right to the motion because, sorry, we've talked about this, but yep. I think before, but. I make a motion to approve these positions. Second. Motion I make, second by Leah. Is there discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll vote. Roll call vote. Meg? Aye. Leah? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm an aye as well, and I thank you for bringing this forward. Let's get some relief for the nurses. Yes. And uh, food service staffing at the middle school, Dr. Uh, Ms. Rathamek, sorry. Um. Thank you. So the, the middle school program has actually always been very, very busy. So last year we were already looking at the need to add staff to that middle school. Um, but then of course COVID happened, we went to uh, hybrid and so not knowing what would happen with the participation. But even during this time, the meal participation at the middle school has increased steadily. Um, so what we're looking for is to add a second assistant cook baker that would put the middle school staff uh, in line with the high school and um, the participation pretty much would mirror that as well. Question, Nancy? Quick question. Just the funding for this, is this does this remain self-funded through um, what we get reimbursed for the meals that are being used in the cafeteria? Yes, yeah, so the food service program is a self-funded program. However, as you can imagine during COVID times, we are running at a loss. And you can see that within the, um, the revolving accounts that is part of the, the um, financial report. So it is, it is not, lost revenue for food service is not something that's covered 
by COVID. So even though we're running um, and we're fully being reimbursed from the federal meals program, um, it's still that all food services across the country are running at a loss. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, just to follow up. I, I, on the other hand, the the, the school te the testing uh, resource that we just previously approved that would be covered by the COVID funding. Is that right? That's correct. Right. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Just looking for the net impact of these. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Levin, so this would be a permanent position that would continue next yes. year. And yes. um, I know you said back in the financial report, our salary accounts are currently running favorable slightly, unlike our expense account, would this would come out of that account? So no, that what you, that, that cover page is really just the operating budget. Mm -hmm. So a couple pages in are, shows the, the balances within the revolving accounts. So that would be like your bus fee revolving, your building use revolving and school lunch would be another one. So the school lunch is not reflected as part of that. We can run a deficit in that revolving account. Okay. Does anyone want to make a motion? I make a motion to approve this position. Second. Motion by Meg, second by Leah. Any more discussion? Okay. Uh, Meg, how do you vote? Aye. Leah? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm an aye as well. Thank you very much. That passes. Um, are we on to the gifts? Hold on. On with gift account? Yes, we are. With Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. Um, so we are simply looking for you to approve a $25 gift check uh, from Matthew, Matthew Colleran and El Elmwood Parent. Um, a, he organized a fundraiser and parents who bought pies over the holiday had a chance to designate 20% of their purchase to a particular school and $25 is going to the Elmwood school if you approve it. Very nice. I make a motion to accept this gift. I second. Motion by Meg. I'm going to give a second to Joe. Uh, to roll call vote, Meg. Aye. Leah? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Yes. Mom and I as well. Thank you very much for that donation. Uh, policy GCRD tutoring for pay. Third reading, Dr. Kavanaugh and the outstanding policy team. All right, I'll quickly uh, go through some of this. So you'll see that this policy has shrunk since the last time you looked at it. And this is the third time you're looking at it. And I will say that as a policy working group, we have talked this policy over and over and over again, and, and we've really beaten it. Um, and so now I think we're bringing it to you because we need some decisions to be made maybe by the entire group. So you'll see how much of this has been green lined up at the top. And the sentence that used to say, teachers and other public employees may not approach a student or the student's parents seeking private tutoring work. Um, that makes sense. But one of the things that we were a little distraught about, I think, is that when a teacher goes to a child's parents and says, you know, I think that, that your kid could benefit from tutoring, there are certainly families who have benefited from that. You know, they've gone out and they've gotten their child a private tutor and things have really turned around for the, the student. But um, the other part of this that we worry about a lot is equity and access. So if you say to a parent, your child would benefit from tutoring and the parent says, well, thank you, but realizes that it's very, very challenging for that family to afford tutoring um, at you know, very high rates, um, we, we, we struggled with it. So where we are now is we are down to that, that very a definition and then that simple paragraph um, that kind of outlines the rules and where we left it was that, um, Tutoring can only be recommended for a student um, if the appropriate teacher of record is involved and consulted, but then there, and it has to be of real help, and that, you know, there has to be um, maybe a little bit of consultation also with a guidance counselor or a principal, and after that consultation, uh, they would provide a family who asked for it a list of eligible tutors, and um, obviously, you know, and I think this goes with state regulation as well. A tutor cannot be the teacher's current, the student's current teacher of record. So it's very, very simple what we have there now. Very simple. 
Megan Leah, do you have anything to add before we jump in? I think we have expended a lot of verbiage on this very small policy. So I would like to hear what you have to say. I, I agree with Meg. We uh, went over and over and over this and have reworded it. And I think we've finally gotten to a place where we're all sort of semi okay with what we see here. And, and it seems to cover the right things that we wanna hear from you. Nancy. So I, I have some hesitation, even though I appreciate how much you guys have put into this. I have hesitation with a classroom teacher recommending tutoring to a family for two reasons. One is the equity issue uh, and families that are told your child would benefit from tutoring that don't have access to the resources for, for that kind of a service. So that's one. The other issue I worry about is that if a teacher is recommending tutoring for a student, I worry that if there's any kind of an underlying issue that's preventing the child from accessing the curriculum within the school day uh, and what would normally be being done, is, there, is this really something that ought to be shifted off to an outside person or, or you know, whether it be a, somebody who works on the side as a tutor who also works in Hopkinton or a tutor through a, you know, a different agency. I, I think tutoring can be a great thing for people who seek it out themselves, but I get a little bit nervous um, with, when that could potentially be coming from the teacher first rather than a parent first. It's a good I'm just, point. I'm just curious about the, with the rewording, I'm wondering, did you guys provide for it coming from the teacher first? Because it looks like it, you need a teacher to agree that it would be useful, but did you, can the teacher initiate the recommendation? I don't think we've stated that here. What, what we tried to do was to create a number of checks. Okay. So there has to be consultation, not just with the, you know, the family, if they want to initiate it, they have to talk with the principal or the principal has to be consulted and a guidance counselor has to be consulted because we were very concerned for all of the reasons that Nancy just articulated about equity. So we wanted to make sure there were a lot of people involved um, to make sure that this was absolutely necessary, that it didn't mean the student really wasn't getting the supports he or she needs at school, but we didn't want to preclude allowing it at all. So this was our vaguely worded compromise. Yeah, and I think we, using that first sentence, the tutoring should not be the first, nor should it be the only intervention. I think we were trying to get at that place of, you know, is there something else that should be done alongside or before you move to tutoring. Yeah, and, and just to echo what Meg said, I think that's where the guidance counselor piece came in. We, we were all really concerned with the SPED angle. We, we didn't want a child to be referred to tutoring based on uh, an issue that should have been addressed in the school that maybe people didn't realize was happening, right? So by, by bringing in the guidance counselor and the principal, we were hoping that they would give alternate views into what was happening with the student and perhaps offer up um, alternative services if those seemed in, that they would meet the need for the student. So thank, thank you for that. That actually does help alleviate some of my concerns with regard to the special education or potential needs that ought to be met within the schools. But I, I do still have an equity issue. Just with regard to families who might not be able to access the financial resources. We, we, <laughs> I know. we had, no, 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 we had the same discussion. <laughs> I can imagine knowing both of you, knowing both of you, this was probably a really in-depth and very thorough conversation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm laughing just because I don't, I don't think it's hard to get around tutoring, right, which by its kind of nature 
has some kind of cost associated to it and and equity right it, it's really difficult to marry the two things and so i think in the end what the reason um, we brought this forward is because it is the tutoring policy so the policy in and of itself centers around the idea of tutoring um, and we wanted to clarify the most equitable way to provide tutoring. And we were hoping that the list that the principals or guidance counselors provide as a procedure would maybe include more equitable options. So I, I think that's where we kind of ended up with if there are, you know, people who are willing to do it pro bono, if there are teachers who are willing to help students after school for some reason, if they're right, uh, the principal and the guidance counselor would hopefully know about that and add that to the list. But I agree with you, there's no easy answer. <laughs> Joe, where are you on this? I thought Nancy might be impressed with our rather evasive phrasing there, <laughs> which is really suggesting to everyone, don't ask for this, please, because we're gonna make it so difficult. Only because, you know, the equity issue is, is very worrisome, as you say, but I think we have enough safeguards here in this policy as it stands. Um, it, it, it can't happen quickly. No, but are there resources, and I guess this is more um, for Dr. Kavanaugh, maybe has more information, but are there resources that within the town, I know the school doesn't do this, but that we're aware of that provide low cost or low or no cost tutoring for families that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford tutoring? So I do know that, you know, through like National Honor Society and those kinds of things, we, we do have kids accessing sort of free tutoring. Um, and Jen, you may know uh, of other situations just having been in, in buildings and watching, you know, kind of what happens with kids and, and all of that. Uh, and you know that our, our teacher contracts, middle school and high school, ask for teachers to be after school with kids at least one day a week. And, and I see that is really vibrant. I mean, and I think it's happening way more than just one day a week. Pre-pandemic, there would be kids in that high school all afternoon and often working with teachers, often working with each other. Um, so I do think that there's a lot of means that kids have that, that don't cost money, but I don't really know of any aside from something like National Honor Society, a formal program, but maybe I, I just don't know when it exists. I wonder if Don would be a good person to ask about that. Um, youth and Family Services, if there's any sort of free tutoring or, or other tutoring resources that we don't know about. So just, just to kind of go back. So the, the purpose of this policy is to make sure that, I, I guess part of the, the red sentence that you, you know, tutoring is not the answer, the immediate answer when a child is struggling and that teachers aren't, which I don't think they are, but you know, just it's to, it's to protect, prevent teachers from, I suppose, tutoring their own students that, that would, they would normally just treat as after school assistance or before school assistance. So we're not trying to prevent, and we can't prevent parents from seeking out tutoring. So I don't know, I know you crossed out the first sentence of a Hawkenden teacher cannot recommend that one of his or her own students receive tutoring. Um, you know, I think as a parent, if your child is struggling, the first place I would turn to, I think, would be the teacher, you know, to have a conversation. I might initiate a question if I'm aware of the, of the struggle. Hopefully I am. I might initiate that question. I'd like to be able to get actual advice from the teacher. I'd like them to be able to say if in their professional opinion, they actually thought it would be of assistance. I like the idea of going to another set of professionals, the guidance counselor and the principal to further understand the, the, the whole picture. Um, so I like what you've put here because I think as a parent, this feels like I'm going to get guidance. I've started the conversation and you're helping me navigate and determine if, if, if I'm being 
if I'm accurate in my assessment. So as a parent, kind of thinking it through, I like what you've provided. I also totally understand what Nancy, what you're, you know, we, we need to make sure that all students can access the services recommended by our teachers. I can see why you spend hours going around and around. Yeah. <laughs> so there's one way we can resolve this. May I, may I make a motion uh, to, uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve GCRD as presented to us tonight, Hawkins and School Committee Policy Tutoring for Pay. Second. So, second by Meg. Is there discussion, further discussion? I guess the one thing for me, and I, I'm not going to beat a, a dead horse, so to speak here, but um, would be if we could have those conversations with, with Dawn at Youth and Family Services or look into what the access would be for free and low cost tutoring so that it's more equitable for if the schools recommending it for other students, all students to be able to access something. And then through you, Amanda, the chair, part of discussion, would it be possible, as we've done with other policies, to have an addendum or follow-up if there's anything else like that that we want to add later? We can always bring this back if, right. there's, if we have new information or, or a new clarification on resources. Dr. Kavanaugh and Leah, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought we decided that we didn't want to talk about alternative free sources of tutoring because it didn't fall under the purview of tutoring for pay. So, and so we're actually starting to have a conversation about different policies. So, so I agree, I don't wanna add it into this policy necessarily, yeah. but just in looking at the resources that the schools have available, if we're giving out a list of tutors to parents that need it or ask for it, I think it would be nice if we knew of if there are free and low cost things to put on that resource separate from this policy to kind of take it away from this group, but to maintain our commitment to access and equity. Ms. Parsi. I apologize for belaboring this also. I know you've been at it for a long time, but one question that I do have on this is, would the, is the intent of this policy that the school would never provide a list of interested tutors to a family if a family does ask for it? without going through the steps of working with guidance, working with the principal, working with the teacher. That's how I'm reading it. And I know that we do often have families who will come and say, I just want someone to work with my child because I can't do it as the mom. They don't listen to me. I need someone to help. And the way that I read this, that does make it sound, but maybe that was the intent, maybe it wasn't, that there would be no um, production of a list of interested teachers without kind of going through a, a number of steps. When you have that request, who is the source of information, if not the principal or the guidance counselor? Is it the teacher? Um, well, so that's a good example. So for like at Marathon School, I think Kelly Pickens, who is the guidance counselor, has historically maintained a list. Um, but it wouldn't be because the school has kind of given their stamp of approval that this, yes, this child needs the tutoring. It would be that the parent has come and said, I don't know where to turn. Do there happen to be any teachers who are interested? Or I could see a similar situation happening at the high school if you're, you really need some help with higher level math and you just can't manage that. As a parent, does the guidance office maintain a list where teachers have voluntarily um, put their names on something that a parent could just access? So the, the way I read this, it would kind of not allow us to do that any longer. But maybe the intent, I don't know. Well, so <laughs> yeah. that's the not intent, the intent. Then, well, yes, if that's not the intent, we'll vote no. You know, we'll see. It's, it's written as it's written. We all understand it. Mm -hmm. um, now we can vote. Well, I, I, but I actually, I, before we vote, I want to go back to what Jen said. It, it, I, I wouldn't, it, it's been kind of the practice of the schools that if a parent reaches out and asks for a tutoring list that that's been provided, is that no longer going to be the case or will that still be allowed to my thinking that would still be allowed like this policy would not preclude this so i think what we were trying to get at was that a teacher would just say boy your child needs tutoring without really thinking hard about you know what can we do for this child before we move to tutoring i think yeah, that struggles yeah the policy even as it was written before i'd always address the 
initiation by the school or teacher for tutoring as opposed to a parent asking about tutoring. So it, um, what we've done is basically set, gone from the teacher cannot give advice, cannot say that a child needs tutoring to, okay, well, it seems like the teacher knows the child the best. So let's say the guidance counselor and the principal have to be involved in a decision if the school will recommend tutoring. But I don't, I don't think it in any way precludes parents asking for the list, just like it didn't before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's good clarification. Okay, so we have a motion on the table that has been seconded, I think. Can we vote? Okay. I'm wondering one more thing before you vote. Does it yes. make sense to put in one sentence that says that the school does not pay for private tutoring? Just to clarify. I, I think we'll see how, sorry, through you, Mandy, go ahead. Go ahead. The motion is as written. So that's all I could say. I made a motion for what was written and it's been seconded. Yeah. I think there's a suggested amendment is what I'm hearing, but yeah. that's it's been received. <laughs> okay. So we have a motion. We have a second. So Meg, how do you vote? I. Leah. Aye. Joe. Aye. Nancy. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. And so it passes. I do like the pared down version. I'm, I'm hoping uh, that we can, Dr. Kavanaugh, maybe get some data at the end of, you know, maybe not this year, but the end of next school year, sort of see, or the middle of next school year, see if we have any sense of um, usage, if this is actually serving its purpose um, and, and is it being uh, accessed? Is it being called into play? Are we actually needing this policy as it's written? Is it, is it becoming, is it doing what it's supposed to do? I think that's one of the things that we as a school committee are supposed to do is sort of monitor whether our policies perform as intended. So I'd like to put in the back burner um, a thought about how we assess this maybe a year from now. Okay. Thank you so much for all that work on that. Um, I need to scroll back up to my agenda. All right, we are up to future agenda items. Well, I have one. <laughs> um, so I think uh, on our agenda, sometime coming up in this spring, I think um, there's been a, a question about, can we talk about um, student participation at our meetings? We, uh, we love when the students come and I'm, I'd like to see us maybe have some conversation at an upcoming meeting where we can look at our policy. We actually have this in a policy, um, look at our, what we're doing with the student council reps and kind of think about how we would like that to look in next year. It's a suggestion. So I'd like to put that when we have space on the agenda. Anybody else have agenda items? So I know we've already voted this, but I'm not bringing it up as a, as a vote idea, but um, it seems like there needs to be a little bit of clarification on sort of why we voted to open the high school. And I thought it would be it would be nice in a future agenda item to kind of bring up the whole, you know, Daffy said we'd give a they'd we'd be given two weeks notice to open it, which seems like a ridiculous amount of time. And, you know, just just all all that information so that we can reiterate it kind of clearly in one place. That would be really nice. Okay. Uh, items by consensus. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, as superintendent, I recommend the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Motion by Nancy, second by Meg. Meg, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Leah? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Um, I believe we have about 15 minutes of executive session that we need to close out from earlier today. So we were going to adjourn uh, from, well, I'll seek a motion for adjournment from public session and then ask school committee members um, to go out to our other link for the closing of our executive session, which we started earlier today. 
I do need a motion to adjourn from here. Motion to adjourn to move to executive session. And I just, I should say, I'm sorry. Uh, the purpose of the executive session was to comply with or act under the authority of MGL 30A, specific to conducting strategy sessions um, regarding negotiating with the Huffington Teachers Association, um, because having those the discussion in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's bargaining position. Thank you. So motion by Joe. Second. Second by Leah. And Meg, how do you vote? Aye. Leah? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nancy? Yes. I'm and I as well, and that we are adjourning to executive session at 9.20. Um, and I think almost everybody here, I think, is going there. So thank you, and I'll see you there, and thank you to the community. Oh, The same link from earlier to get to the executive session. Sorry to. Yes, same link from earlier. And we will not be coming back into public session. We will adjourn from executive session. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you to HCAM.